Andrew Mead McGee from the Smithsonian Institution talking about quantification, quantifying a rights revolution 50 years on. Simone Zhang from Notre Dame University, the asymmetrical effects of pretrial risk assessment algorithms in the courtroom. Katrina, I asked her how to pronounce her name and I forgot it. Can you tell me, Katrina? Gettys, thank you. Um, from NYU. Will you have autonomy in the metaverse? And we have Cooper from Cornell University representing a number of co-authors on the piece um, on machine learning, uncertainty, arbitrariness, and due process. So please, Andrew, take it away. Thank you very much, Meg. Uh, I'd like to thank Aaron for organizing this conference, the Information Society Project for sponsoring it. Thank my fellow panelists, thank Meg for chairing, and thank you to the audience for coming out on the morning of what promises to be a very interesting two days of conversation about big data. I had not anticipated being the first speaker on the first day, but I'm happy to do so in order to provide some historical context from my own research that will inform this moment of data today, remaking the world. Uh, two logistical notes first, the one that I, my paper is not yet up on the site. I think the abstract is, but it will, it will be up eventually. I've uh, been dealing with some, some illness, so it's, it's still in shambles in terms of organization, but the content is all there. And then I'm required to make it a disclaimer that as a federal employee, uh, even though I work for the Smithsonian Institution, the views I am presenting today represent my own findings as a researcher and do not indicate any sort of formal opinion held by the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian, or the government of the United States. So to that end, I want to talk about this moment we're in where data seems so central to understanding policy, to understanding complex issues. We think about an era awash in data. We think about the ways in which asymmetrical data has very real on the ground consequences in the war in Ukraine. We think about the way in which people's obsession with jet chat GPT has taken over conversations within the past couple of weeks. We think about how debates over information gathering, surveillance in public places, social media, all resolve around data. Even fundamental disagreements over the nature of elections and political outcomes in this country often come down to varying interpretations of data that themselves are filtered through media bubbles constructed through data regimes. This is not new. We've seen this before in American history. And I wanna take us back to a moment a half century ago when overt discussion of data had very real policy consequences and shaped the ways activists and policymakers thought about concepts of justice in regards to social welfare, urban development, and domestic policy more generally. Now, it's always good to start conversations about the minutia of data with a bang, so let's start with a riot. In 1974, January, New York City, Hundreds of applicants for the newly created Supplemental Security Income Program administered by the Social Security Administration are gathered outside of the Regional Social Security Office in Manhattan, pounding on the doors in the early chilly morning to be led into the building. Their checks had not arrived, the checks they had been promised as part of this new program. The scene is replicated in cities across the country, Baltimore, Cleveland, Oakland, but in New York, the crowds grow so dense, the social security staffers refuse to open the office. Police are called, buses are ordered by the federal government to put people into to keep them out of the cold while they try to figure out how to de-escalate the situation and disperse the crowds of people who want to know, where is the money I was promised based on the information I gave the government? We'll come back to that moment jump ahead or jump behind, if you will, 10 years to the uh, early mid 1960s. And I will argue that what we see emerging in the policy realm of the 60s that will go on to shape the activist sphere is a regime of total data, one in which the adherence of Lyndon Johnson's great society, the inheritor of John F. Kennedy's new frontier in government, believe that they can utilize the power of large mainframe computers to crunch data and reform American society. 
Johnson's Great Society foot soldiers active in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, HEW, the Social Security Administration, SSA, and the newly created Departments of Transportation and Housing and Urban Development, HUD, which are created around using data processed by computers and run through models, all firmly believe that if they can gather enough information process it correctly, they can solve the seemingly intractable problems of mid-century American society. If you send the right check to the right person at the right time via the Social Security Administration, you can eliminate poverty. If you crunch the right numbers through the right mainframe computers in the basement of bland, brutalist concrete Washington buildings, you can circumvent that pesky question of race. You could ignore that question of social stratification and bam, you fix the urban crisis. Cities are resolved. This is the mentality of many of the key players in government, in policy positions in Washington in the mid 1960s, moving into the early 1970s. This has consequences both in how policies are designed with the implementation of Medicare, with the expansion of social welfare programs, including supplemental security income that we'll get to in a minute, but it has effects on larger designs in politics. Even when presidential administrations shift and Richard Nixon comes in, many of the bureaucrats and policymakers stay the same. And under the guise of new federalism, even new policy approaches like the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency are also rooted in data. And the idea is that control of data leading to analysis will permit very specific policy outcomes. Throughout the late 1960s and early 1970s, we see activist groups becoming aware of the increasing dominance of this total data mentality in groups ranging from mainstream civil rights organizations like the Southern, Leadership, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Coalition and the Urban League realize that they can use data analysis to push some of those decisions. Now, the role of data activism is not an elaborate one or a particularly notable one in the, role, in the work of these mainstream civil rights groups, but it's there at the fringes and it grows increasingly prominent over the course of the late 1960s as the left-leaning rights coalition begins to fragment into smaller portions. Uh, the, civil, uh, the SCLC, for instance, sponsors a boycott program called Operation Breadbasket in which they request of large-scale food and dairy manufacturers their hiring practices around African Americans. Companies that don't supply data on their hiring are boycotted for not supplying data. The implication being that if you don't provide the information, it's tantamount to already being discriminatory. As we move towards more radical fringes of activist groups, the Black Panthers talk about using computers gathering data to try to combat what they see as the impressive dominance of federal mainstream computers. Even more radical activists uh, in gender and environmental constituencies also talk about the need to mobilize around data in order to combat the man, the establishment. What does the man have? He has an IBM System 360. We need information. We need data. We need sympathetic figures who can crunch numbers to work on our behalf. This dichotomy is observed by social scientists and public intellectuals of the day, many of whom are affiliated with law schools and legal programs. The leading such figure is Alan F. Weston, who in 1971, 72, and 73 publishes a series of books focused on data banks in society. He's mostly remembered as a privacy researcher today, but what he examines is the way in which information, the assimilation and aggregation and analysis of data by large-scale institutions, banks, government agencies, can have unforeseen consequences on the privacy and broader rights of American citizens. A number of other intellectuals like Ida Hughes from Berkeley expand on these investigations. And what culminates is this series of public debates in the pages of newspapers and congressional hearings around the role of data in society. 
this will lead to the passage of the Privacy Act of 1974, which at its core is a series of data controls for companies that engage in contracting for the federal government, but sets the standard for how we talk about data, bits of information, as used as levers of policy. When we think about privacy in the 70s, we think about Roe v. Wade, we think about contraception, we think about choice, but there's a parallel movement to talk about privacy, to talk about information as terms of control of knowledge of citizens, and that extent of knowledge on the reels of tapes held on computers by large-scale institutions. This is where I promise to get back to these protests, these street scuffles in 1974. The Social Security Administration in the mid-1960s was the most trusted government agency in America because they were seen as keepers of information. They knew how to use IBM computers to manage the data on hundreds of millions of Americans to send out payments when they needed to. Social Security was more trusted than NASA. They were seen as competent and efficient, but they took on more than they could manage when they absorbed state welfare programs for the poor, the blind, the disabled, people who didn't necessarily fit within pre-existing social security data categories. This led to payments fouling up systems, being misdirected, not being sent out, hence the series of disruptions and street protests in those chilly January weeks of the first few pay periods of 1974. Called before congressional overseers, panicked officials said, the problem is they don't fit the data. It's the wrong people. It's not the right data. And that's the narrative I think we will probably continue to explore throughout this weekend's conference. What is this intersection of people and institutions with data? What is the right data? What is the wrong data? And how do those interpretations of that data flow through systems to make the world we know today? 50 years on, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Next up, we have Simone's piece. Next, we have Katrina. Thanks. Can you hear me? Great. Um, great. Thanks, Aaron and the other organizers. And thanks, Meg, for sharing. Um, <laughs> my paper will be a, a slight shift from the quantitative to the philosophical. Um, so. So I want to start by explaining how this my intervention fits within the existing literature. So over the last two decades, as many of you know, in response to the increasing ubiquity of surveillance technologies, um, privacy law scholars have proposed a variety of strategies to prohibit the collection of personal data, presuming that such data would be used for harmful purposes and presuming that the individual is best placed to identify and promote their privacy interests. This focus on prohibiting the collection of personal data, while important, has not always wrestled with the larger and more difficult question of how can we use that data once it has been collected. So in this paper, I explore um, the use of personal data specifically to inform predictions about future behavior. So the question is, when can we use the data that we have collected to make predictions about future behavior. So in this article, I look at the relationship between prediction and autonomy, where the behavior being predicted is subject to individual control. So just as surveillance technologies expose the limits of privacy law, here I argue that predictive technologies are exposing the unlimited power of the preemptive state. The volume of data gathered on individual citizens combined with the processing power of large computational models dramatically increases the range of human behaviors that can be predicted and preempted. And the absence of technological constraints on prediction reinforces the importance of our normative commitments to autonomy. So in this article, I test the limits of those commitments by comparing two institutions that depend for their legitimacy on respect for personal autonomy. Those institutions are criminal justice and democracy. So in theory, a political party has a legitimate mandate to govern only if it has been elected by a majority of voters and those votes were autonomously cast. Similarly, criminal punishments are legitimated by their contingency on proof of autonomous conduct. So the state can legitimately punish a criminal defendant only after it has proven 
usually beyond reasonable doubt, that the defendant autonomously committed the crime for which they're being punished. So the institutional legitimacy of both democracy and criminal law depend on their respect for the autonomous choices made by individuals. Despite this shared normative foundation, these two institutions, democracy and criminal justice, differ completely in their treatment of prediction. So in criminal justice, um, judges routinely rely on predictions of future behavior to make decisions about pretrial detention and post-conviction incarceration. In contrast, in democratic elections, we do not use predictions about votes to form a democratic legislature. And my question is, why not? Given the amount of data that states and firms now possess about individual voters, it would not be hard to predict how someone is likely to vote in an upcoming election. So why do we maintain the process of voting? Why not abandon the long queues, the ballot counts, um, the voting booths, and just form a Congress on the basis of predicted votes? So assuming an equivalent amount of data is available on every voter, predictive voting could actually potentially deliver a legislature that is more representative than the current system, where low voter turnout effectively erases the preferences of millions of Americans. So why don't we have a system of predictive voting? Why does the state deprive defendants of liberty on the basis of algorithmic prediction, but decline to use the same tools to form a democratic legislature? What explains these differing approaches to prediction, despite, as I've said, the shared normative foundation of these two institutions? So in this article, I begin the project of identifying what are the limits to the inferences that public institutions can draw about individuals, about their future behavior, using the data they've collected. Um, so a little bit about the structure of the paper. Um, first, I explore the relationship between prediction and autonomy, where the behavior being predicted is subject to individual control. Essentially, my argument is that when a determination of an, in, an individual's rights or interests is made on the basis of their expected future behavior, that person suffers a loss of decisional autonomy. So when a defendant is preemptively incarcerated for X additional years beyond some retributively defined minimum because they're expected to recidivate if released, the defendant is denied the opportunity to make that choice, whether to recidivate or not, for themselves. Similarly, if Congress is formed on the basis of predicted votes, voters are denied the opportunity to elect their preferred party or candidate for themselves. So both decisions to preemptively incarcerate a high-risk recidivist or to appoint a candidate on the basis of predicted votes, both of those decisions restrict the capacity of defendants and voters to make autonomous choices. Um, so in this paper, I define voter autonomy as the deliberative and expressive freedom to choose a preferred party or candidate and to express that preference at the ballot box. Historically, we've been concerned with expressive autonomy, so the ability to cast a ballot freely without intimidation or coercion from a particular party, and that's why we have secret ballots. Currently, proponents of democracy are more concerned with concern with threats to deliberative autonomy from things like voter micro-targeting. So this is when political candidates tailor their messages to fine-grained categories of voters based on sophisticated analysis of their demographic, behavioral, and psychological data. Um, essentially, the system of predictive voting that I hypothesize about would draw on the same practices used by voter micro-targeting today. Okay, so the big question that this paper tries to answer, what explains our differential treatment of vote prediction and recidivism prediction? Why do we tolerate prediction in one context, criminal recidivism, and not the other, which is democratic elections? If making a decision on the basis of an individual's expected future behavior disrespects their autonomy, why do we respect the autonomy of voters more than, the, more than we respect the autonomy of defendants? What explains the persistent use of prediction in criminal justice and the extremely low probability that a liberal democracy would ever install a system of predictive voting? So there are five possible reasons. One possible reason is a dessert-based theory of autonomy. This is the idea that by committing crimes, defendants have forfeited some of the rights that would ordinarily shield them from preventive detention or cause those rights to lose some of their ordinary force or scope. So if an individual chooses to, to commit a crime, they may be punished for this choice, and punishment includes the loss of status as a presumptively law-abiding citizen. So not only does the convicted defendant lose the presumption of past innocence, they may also lose the presumption of future innocence. And once an individual loses the benefit of this presumption, they're no longer immune from preventive detention. The interesting thing about this argument is that if we 
accept that autonomy or the right to autonomy is something that can be lost through bad behavior, then how do we treat people who consistently abstain from voting? If the rationale for predicting recidivism is that defendants have shown that they cannot be trusted to obey the law, does chronic voter abstention justify predicting the votes of non-voters? This is a very difficult question to answer because eliminating voter autonomy on the basis of chronic voter abstention implies that there is a duty to vote either because free writing is morally wrong or because low voter turnout undermines regime legitimacy. And there are many reasons to doubt the existence of a shared moral responsibility to vote, one of them being the unequal distribution of the economic and political resources required to form a capacity for representative thought. Non-voters tend to be poorer, um, less educated, and less able to influence the political agenda than individuals who vote regularly. But I won't go into that here. A second possible reason why we treat voter autonomy differently from defendant autonomy is the fact that many people attach only instrumental and not intrinsic value to autonomy. So they respect autonomy depending on how they expect that autonomy to be autonomy to be exercised. So some members of society may, may view defendant autonomy as more instrument as less instrumentally valuable than voter autonomy because they expect defendant autonomy to be exercised in a morally illegitimate way, the commission of crime. In contrast, voter autonomy may appear more instrumentally valuable because A, there are more voters than defendants, and B, voter autonomy will be exercised in pursuit of a morally legitimate purpose, which is the formation of democratic government. A third possible reason for treating voters and defendants differently is that society appears to have a lower tolerance for computational error in the context of democratic elections and in the context of criminal sentencing. What I mean by this is that the communities with political power to shape criminal policy are generally not the same communities who bear the costs of false positives. So those communities who tend to be very risk averse are obviously in favor of sentence enhancements because it will promote their feeling of community safety. In contrast, the state has a strong interest in protecting voter autonomy in the context of political elections because the distribution of political votes represents the source of their authority to govern. So the state may be very reluctant to delegate to an algorithm or any kind of computational model, a decision-making process that determines its very existence. In contrast, the state is much less existentially concerned with whether or not criminal defendants receive sentence, sentence enhancements on the basis of predictions of recidivism. A fourth possible candidate reason is that voters and defendants have historically been treated very differently by society and so they have different expectations for autonomy in addition to different capacities to enforce those expectations for autonomy. So any political candidate who suggested installing a system of predictive voting would probably be, vo be voted out of office tomorrow. In contrast, criminal defendants who feel misjudged or unseen by predictions of recidivism have very little power to actually combat those predictions. Um, and here I want to highlight some of the felony disenfranchisement laws, which means that communities most affected by incarceration have very limited capacity to affect criminal policy. A fifth possible reason um, why we treat defendant autonomy differently from voter autonomy is the sense that society derives substantial utility from preemptively incarcerating high-risk recidivists in the form of increased public safety and would derive minimal utility or less utility from a system of predictive voting. Obviously, this depends on who you speak to. Um, there are many political parties and candidates, um, I'm sure you guys can think of a, of a few, who would love to rely on historical voting data in order to justify their continued authority to govern. Um, but in general, the use of a predictive practice turns on its utility or disutility for the dominant social group. So as I said, because the majority of the risk averse public feels that their communities are safer by virtue of sentence enhancements, um, prediction continues to be used in criminal justice and is not used in democratic elections. Um, in conclusion, the point of this paper is really to emphasize the fact that as predictive, as predictive algorithms normalize ex ante intervention, individuals will be afforded less and less time to make decisions for themselves before the state preemptively intervenes. And the benefits of this temporality will be unequally distributed, as I've shown, between voters and defendants. Basically, the most powerless among us will experience the greatest autonomy losses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. We're getting Cooper's slides set up and feel free to start whenever they are.
Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Cooper. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Cornell, and I'm going to talk about some work today regarding the relationship between uh, statistical variance in machine learning and arbitrariness. Uh, this project is in collaboration with various folks at Cornell and Microsoft Research, but I want to call special attention to Medea Choksi, who is also attending the conference today. Uh, so at this point, uh, it's well known, I, I think it's well known, that machine learning can replicate and even magnify human biases. Um, but in some recent scholarship, uh, particularly in legal scholarship, there's a lot of optimism that machine learning can improve upon human decision making in other respects. Most notably, there's a line of argument that makes the case that algorithmic decision systems will root out unwanted variability in human decisions. For example, different magistrates handing down significantly inconsistent judgments for similar cases. Some of this work, like this paper by Cass Sunstein, calls such inconsistencies noise and claims that machine learning can eliminate it for good. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. The perception of machine learning, this perception of machine learning misunderstands how statistical models are produced. And we provide a bit more precision around how these types of models are produced. We can in fact see that machine learning exhibits its own problems related to decisional inconsistency. And the machine learning concept that maps onto this inconsistency is called statistical variance. In our paper, we show how statistical variance can be interpreted in relation to arbitrariness in machine learning decision outcomes. We discuss why this type of arbitrariness is really important to understand when doing legal analysis that involves machine learned rules. In fact, our contributions provide a crisp, precise understanding of why the behavior of ML rules is so fundamentally different from the way legal scholars conceive of how legal rules are ideally supposed to function. And these observations help ground some additional contributions regarding technological due process. I obviously don't have time to get into all this today. So instead, my goal is to give a sense of what our project is attempting to achieve through an intuition for the type of arbitrariness that we are talking about. So to start, let's say we're training 10 logistic regression models on Compass. So Compass is a highly contested binary classification task that fits actually under the heading of the kind of uh, risk assessment tools that Professor Zhang was talking about. And it's been used in the past, uh, actually not sure if it's still used, I really hope not, uh, to predict prison recidivism. Uh, despite being contested, uh, it has, however, remained a common benchmark task in algorithmic fairness research on the computer science side. To be able to uh, train 10 different logistic regression models, we're going to use something called the bootstrap method. I'm going to skip over what this means precisely and just note that bootstrapping lets us run the same overarching machine learning process to produce, produce these 10 models. That means the same training algorithm, the same model type, the same data distribution. However, even though the overarching data distribution is the same, during training, the machine learning process randomly samples date training data examples from that distribution. And because of this random sampling, each of the 10 models will be trained on slightly different da training data examples. So the models we produce will learn different underlying decision rules. We can then take our 10 different learned models and see how they predict for two individuals from Compass. And that's what's plotted in this figure. So as I mentioned before, Compass is formulated as a binary classification problem. So there are two prediction outcomes. Zero, the negative class, means that the individual is predicted not to recidivate whereas one, the positive class, means that they are predicted to recidivate. All 10 models uh, produce the same prediction for individual one. We can interpret this to mean that the overall learning process we've run on Compass is really certain with respect to how it classifies individual one. If we were to pick just one of these 10 models at random to use in practice, it wouldn't have an effect on how individual one is classified. Things are really different for individual two. Five of the models predict that individual two will recidivate, and the other five predict that they will not. We can interpret this to mean that the overall learning process is really uncertain with respect to how it classifies individual two. Unlike the case for individual one, if we were to pick a model at random, just one model to use in practice, the classification could go either way. Put differently, how this process classifies individual two is arbitrary. These kinds of cross-model comparisons have a close relationship with statistical variance, which we describe, describe in more detail in the paper. I also want to note that 20% of people in the Compass data set resemble individual two in this case, which is to say that 20% of people in Compass have decision outcomes that are effectively arbitrary. 
The randomness that enables these results is fundamental to, mach to machine learning. Sampling from distributions, training on subsets of data, these are features of how machine learning works as a tool to produce models in the first place. In this sense, variance is unavoidable. It may even in some cases be desirable. And a lot of legal literature recognizes that randomness is a feature of machine learning, but it doesn't talk about it in relation to the variance that's revealed in this picture. And that's a problem, uh, because when variance results in this kind of arbitrariness that I've described, it's clearly a bad thing. So we argue that legal and regulatory work on machine learning needs to account for variance, and to do so, more fundamentally, this work needs to change the way that it talks about randomness. So to be concrete about what this means, I want to layer in some conceptual precision about randomness, um, machine learning, and learned rules. In the law and many regimes that involve rules, it's generally easier to think about inputs always resulting deterministically in the same particular outputs. But everything that I've talked about today in terms of variance and arbitrariness gets at a totally different paradigm, one in which the relationship between inputs and outputs is non-deterministic. That is, supplying the same inputs to this to a machine learning process can produce drastically different outputs. This is just putting a term on, the, on what we've already seen in this figure. Given the same learning process, we can produce models that yield different concrete predictive outcomes, which, taken together, can convey different degrees of predictive confidence for different inputs. This is in stark contrast to deterministic if-then logic, which the same inputs always produce the same outputs. It's this kind of logic that governs a lot of the code is law um, sort of uh, literature, but I'm not going to get into that today. In this respect, thinking deterministically about machine learning can make it look like different decisions are equally confident, when in fact there may be large variations in co confidence across inputs. And yet, most of the legal literature that talks about machine learning thinks deterministically. It engages with machine learning after training and model selection have occurred. And at this point in the machine learning pipeline, there's commonly only a single model to consider that encodes a single deterministic decision rule. So one of our contributions, based on some prior part work I published last year, is to recommend shifting away from this mode of thinking. Instead of thinking about a single model with a single deterministic decision rule, we should instead be think reasoning about the entire learning process as being able to produce a distribution over possible models with different deterministic decision rules. To show why this change matters so much, we can map what I've been talking about to Sunstein's claims when he says that machine learning decisions are, quote, noiseless. Sunstein is conceiving of a single deterministic decision rule. Instead, thinking about distributions over possible models starts to make clear why this can be, be, why this can be misleading. While it's true that a single model, unlike a human, will always deterministically produce the same output when given the same input, this picture exposes that there is non-determinism in machine learning at the level of different possible models, non-determinism that can lead to effectively arbitrary outcomes, which maps on to a similar intuition of noisiness that Sunstein is talking about. For another example, Ben Baradol's work on, a small change, on how small changes can make big differences makes the argument that randomness in training can lead to a model having a decision rule for which there are disproportionately dissimilar outcomes for similar inputs. They observe that this breaks the treat like alike principle, which in the context of machine learning could be understood to mean that similar inputs should yield similar outputs. Bam Bauer et al. discuss how randomness in machine learning is the culprit for, for, uh, for producing deterministic models that violate treat like alike. While this is one effect of randomness, our work on variants shows that this idea is in fact much more complicated. It's not just the case that machine learning can treat two similar inputs very differently. It's also possible for machine learning to treat the same input very differently, as is the case with individual two. Seeing this view, however, requires looking at multiple models, in this case, 10 instead of just one. At the level of just one deterministic model, we'd only see one prediction for individual two. We wouldn't see how randomness makes their associated classifications so unstable, in turn raising completely different questions concerning treat like alike. For one final example, Creel and Hellman recently take a, phil a formal philosophical approach to analyze what it means for machine learning to be arbitrary. They claim that arbitrariness of machine learning systems is itself not the problem. Rather, there's a problem if arbitrariness happens repeatedly to the same person. In relation to this claim, they add, quote, to the extent that an algorithm governs the decision, it will produce the same result when run on the same inputs. If the algorithm contains a degree of randomness within it, it is still reproducible at a higher level of abstraction. Our work again shows that this isn't the whole story. 
for one, we know by now, hopefully, that an algorithm will not necessarily produce the same result when run on the same inputs. Second, thinking about randomness and reproducibility in this way is not quite correct. We could predictably reproduce these results for these two individuals in Compass over and over again. So the predictions for individual two are in fact reproducible, but they are nevertheless also still arbitrary, given the underlying lack of confidence they reflect. As we develop this paper, we're going to synthesize observations like this in relation to prior work to show how reasoning about distributions over possible models and variants can help us reinterpret prior legal scholarship with greater precision. We will get into how, in relation to machine learning rules, this precision complicates fundamental understandings of words like consistency, non-arbitrariness, and predictability, which get applied aspirationally to rules in the law. Instead, for example, we can show, based on our analysis, that machine learning rules can be consistently and predictably arbitrary, a mouthful of concepts that I would be really excited to endeavor to explain offline. We'd also like to show how this frame presents underexplored implications for technological due process, and in the other direction, it can even suggest new insights into when and how legal rules can break down. So with that, I'll wrap up and say, if you're interested in reading about detailed computer science results on this topic, please check out our recent print print on archive, but maybe wait a week or two because I want to update it. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you all so much. We've got a wide range of papers. We're going to try to tie them together. And I'm going to do that while you guys um, queue up your, your questions. I think we take questions at the mic. Is that, yeah. is that? Uh, Brandon wants to ask questions here. We'll also be taking questions uh, online. Uh, and Niv will actually help you with that. So um, uh, we write, uh, <laughs> so, so great. You can, you can guide your questions as well. Perfect. And how long do we have? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we've done at 1040. So we have about uh, a little over 40 minutes. Oh, great. Okay, I'm going to try to tie some of these together based on the way that um, my, my brain created a thread. And I kept thinking about institutions and cultures and players. And Andrew, you mentioned that one institution was highly trusted because it was the operator of a powerful mainframe. But I also wonder how we should think about institutional trust and power realignments when we introduced when we introduce automated decision making as institutional. I couldn't help but think, and this is just um, not at all validated. Uh, I literally just thought of this. As institutional confidence decreases, we have more and more computers being thrust into institutions. And I and I thought to myself, um, oh, is that what we're doing? We're like, oh, people are not liking us. Let's automate this. Let's outsource this. And as I'm sitting here, I have my little timer here that was going to beep so that I didn't have to inter intervene, right? Like there's this authority that we're like, oh, we'll shift it to a computer and they can sort of do the the dirty tough work and I think Andrew said the pesky the pesky work of ignoring or ignoring the pesky factors like race and, and fairness um but in in doing so are we simply reinforcing or re-entrenching the same power dynamics which is what I see play out in Simone's um piece and I, I have a couple of questions uh about what that really looks like um on the ground and those power dynamics between players and who gets to to claim authority over those um those models then <laughs> Katrina's uh piece yeah. asks this amazing question which is why do we have to vote to sort of bury it in the piece but when I read it I thought oh my gosh this takes Dave Eggers uh, uh, approach to voting in the circle where it's like, oh, everybody should have to vote through their Facebook app and the whole thing won't, it won't work until you vote for someone. She takes it a step further and is like, no, 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 you don't even have to push the button. The system will just vote for you. Um, and it's interesting to think about why she, she said that there's no interest in that. I think in large part because of institutional trust. Though I do wonder if you told people like you don't have to vote anymore, your computer will just do it for you. Like your iPhone will just 
do it for you. I, I wonder if they would say, oh, yes, go ahead, uh, do that. It does a great job of predicting all kinds of, of other parts of my life. Um, but it's not because of the automation or the model, I think, that people aren't interested in that politically. I think it's the people who control those models. Um, and even when the models are clean, they're messy. Um, I think that's that's my takeaway from, from Cooper's project. Even when we try to clean these up, they're still messy. Um, and we want and need a paradigm shift about how we incorporate automated decision-making, particularly into legal functions and legal institutions. Um, so I wonder if each of you could fill in the following blank for me. I wish people, fill in the blank on who, I wish someone, so-and-so, would stop fill in the blank. I wish my kids would stop asking me for lollipops for breakfast. Right? Like, what is the what is the challenge that your piece puts to who? Because I'm interested in the bedfellows here, and I'm interested in these big paradigms. Um, and I think each of your pieces gets at something that you're trying to help us shift the way that we think. Um, can any or all of you answer that question? Yeah, Cooper says yes. Do it for me, please. Uh, I wish people would stop accidentally conflating uh, deterministic rules with the uh, underlying uncertainty or certainty um, in the decisions that are output from those rules. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else have one? I'm working on a piece now that addresses this indirectly, and in that I wish people would stop making plural data singular data because it ignores the fact that data is comprised of data, the idea that they're individuals at the basis of this. And we all too often associate data with this pure revelatory aggregate that must answer the question, when in fact all it does is obscure the outliers and distract us from what's really creating the mean, the external conditions outside of the data. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I, this this paper and, and actually all of my work is motivated by a really strong sense that um, datafication is is not just like fundamentally incomplete, but also like morally very wrong to the extent that it tries to externalize information that I think should be deeply embodied, like someone's emotion or gender orientation or political preference. Um, I think the way that humans psychologically and, and physically form preferences and have emotions and have you know, traumas and other experiences is such a, a deeply embodied process that I really wish computer scientists would stop trying to like predict how someone feels or someone's gender identity using, you know, external things and just ask the person to express that themselves because I think it's really important that embodied information stays embodied and that has privacy implications as well. Okay, I'm going to fill this in for you then. I wish computer scientists would stop doing what they do. <laughs> I, computer scientists do I don't great feel work. Attacked at all. Yeah, no. Um, no, computer scientists do great work. I, I just think I just wish that people would stop trying to predict what someone could just tell you. Like, just ask that person to describe it to you themselves. Like, give that person epistemic power and don't try to take it away from them. Is how I feel. Um, I guess this is less so I wish we would stop, but more I wish we could do more of, which is to, um, I don't know, think about the ways in which like technologies intervene in the relationships, you know, that people have really on the ground. And like one thing that I don't talk about here is, you know, how does this intervene in the relationships between like individuals and court systems the people who are being evaluated in these systems um, that, you know, I think examining the technical sort of features of these tools is really valuable, but um, there's various ways in which all of the complex nuances of the ways we think about them as technical objects, um, there's a whole set of other concerns that happen as they intervene sort of in 
real life, you know, working context and relationships between different actors. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Building on these points, I think all of the papers address in some fashion this fundamental imbalance in justice and the imbalance in justice, not injustice, justice, justice. This idea that we ascribe to computer science, to data, to algorithms, to artificial intelligence as an umbrella category. This idea that we can solve problems by presenting it with what we know and the gaps of what we don't know and assume that it can override the very real human relationships on the ground. And we have done this constantly throughout our history. We used to call it alchemy. Sometimes we would call it the power of steam in the 19th century. It becomes the, the power of physics in the early and middle decades of the 20th century. Now it's this idea of science, of technology, of a very particular way of looking at the world through code to fill in that which is unfulfilled for us. And the process of doing that leaves these human elements all too often behind. Thank you, Andrea. Um, that picks up on, you're right, that picks up on each of these. If you guys don't have questions for each other, I have a bunch. Do we have any chat questions? We do. We do. How do we ask those? Okay, thank you. So this is a question from David Berry. And he asks, what do the panel think about the relationship between AI alignment and the concept of justice, justice with a capital J? What does it tell us about the way these models are working under the hood? And should we be worried about AI alignment as a purported method to make these models, quote unquote, just? I'm just going to say that, uh, particularly in light of the last few weeks and months, I have no idea what AI alignment means anymore. Um, I can tell you what I think it means, um, uh, which is aligned entirely with justice, which is that we're building systems that actually do things that we want them to do in the world. But I actually think that uh, one of the things that this question highlights that's pretty complicated at this point is that a lot of terms like alignment or even accountability or fairness often get co-opted or operationalized in the totally opposite sense when there's a new wave. And again, I'm not also basing this on anything empirically or theoretically justified. This is my own sense. Uh, when there's a new wave of like the latest hot technology that's coming about. And so I'm hearing a lot more talk about AI alignment in relation to chatbots, particularly right now. Um, and I actually think that's kind of, unfortunately, a, a bit of a distraction tactic uh, because like it's asking a seemingly first principles question about what we want AI uh, to do about a specific technology that we have no idea even what people really want to use it for or what it even could be used for. Um, so I'm not answering the question at all. I'm just going to say that I think AI alignment is increasingly confusing what even, what even that means. And I, at least personally, am more concerned with more immediate questions without things that seem perhaps more mundane, like this variance problem that I described, which is affecting people right now. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, this is mostly a question for Chief Katrina, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for, for that, uh, you know, really striking sort of comparison that you set up in the paper and also focusing the idea on the idea of autonomy, which I think is really interesting and could connect to some of the other papers and and also is sort of like a perennial issue in the history of statistical thought, which is which is like, you know, can, you know, like in the 18th century, this is a big problem because it implied a sort of like uh, atheistic materialistic sort of worldview. And I think you're right to suggest, though, that like, like traditionally it was that that problem sort of squared by saying that we could, you know, we could see aggregate tendencies, but we can't actually predict what, what individuals are doing, whether it's, it's just mechanics or molecules or social settings. But um, I just I, I basically just had another a question of like, as you were sort of um, doing your list of, you know, reasons why we might think of these differences, I just I just I just had a of another one and i'm not even sure if i really like agree with it or endorse it but i kind of just wonder what you think and that that is that is that like a reason we could think of autonomy different in these two domains is is something like because democratic will formation is like is somewhat of a more fundamentally expressive thing 
than sentencing somebody. And I wonder if like at the limit that, that this difference comes down to like the difference between politics and law, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a sort of deeper level. So yeah, I'd be really, really interested to hear you think about Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really interesting one. Um, it sort of goes to the broader point that the reason the autonomy of voters, I think, receives more respect than the autonomy of defendants is because they represent a larger block. So this is again, sort of a reference to the distribution of power and how the, the distribution of predictive technologies reflects and, and reinscribes and reinforces existing power structures. Um, yes, voting voting has to be done jointly. So it's sort of a power that's that doesn't have um, real weight unless it's done in conjunction with others. And that is also a very compelling reason why um, we might want to protect voter autonomy and care slightly less about defendants because liberty is such an individual interest, right? Like if a defendant receives a sentence enhancement wrongly because they're low risk and actually they wouldn't have recidivated if they had been released earlier, the, the burden borne by that by that person is so deeply individual. Whereas if we install a system of predictive voting, then everyone who cares about democracy suffers. So, so I agree with you in the sense that there is that sort of numerical difference between defendants and voters. What I would say is that although, although liberty is felt most strongly at the individual level, it does affect communities very deeply when sentence enhancements are distributed and, you know, and the effects of that the effects of that are disproportionately borne by certain communities. So I would say there's also an element of that sort of collective will, um, the same sort of element that you refer to in voting that also happens with criminal policy. It's just that the communities who are affected by those policies don't have the political power, unfortunately, to reshape them in their favor. And so the preferences that we hear about are the more affluent and, and risk averse and wealthy communities who you know, are not disenfranchised because they're not felons and because they are able to actually shape criminal policy and say, well, we feel unsafe. We would prefer if you preemptively incarcerated high risk recidivists. And so that's what happens. Um, but I think your point about democratic um, will expression is a really good one. Thank you. Hi, thanks. I have a question for Feder um, or Cooper. Is that your first name? <laughs> so, um, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about your work in the context of the canonical bias variance trade-off, so we know, you know, any estimator can be the error of any estimator, like legislative regression, like you said, or anything else can be decomposed into, you know, variance and bias, right? And you rightfully point out that there are some concerns about about variance, and uh, but traditionally, you know, there's a trade-off between these two things, and so should we not also be concerned about bias? And is there not a trade-off? Is this? I'm just curious to your thoughts on this. I'm happy to talk about this a lot more offline. Um, the computer science paper gets more into this than I think the law review paper will. Um, the short answer is you can actually measure variance directly empirically, and you can't typically for bias and noise. And I can talk about that more offline as to why that's the case. Um, I also think there's, like I said, this interesting norm normative interpretation for variance that maps on to the way that people talk about legal rules and machine learned rules um, in the law which is also why I've sort of honed in on that. Uh, also, it turns out that focusing on this framing uh, breaks a lot of fundamental theoretical assumptions, at least in practice, in current algorithmic fairness research, um, which is kind of astonishing that if you do something about the problem that I described, a lot of the algorithmic fairness problems in classification context that people have been devoting their entire PhDs to kind of just go away. Which is not to say that the problem of fairness more generally goes away. It's that the algorithmic fairness problem in classification context goes away. And then the last thing I'll say, and I'll avoid your question because it's a much longer answer, is uh, uh, I try not to cast these kinds of things as trade-offs because I think it actually can. It's very useful in engineering, but when I'm trying to have like a broader conversation about whatever sort of values are at play, it can be much easier to conceive of things as in tension with each other. Um, and here you could try to plot bias plus noise versus variance, but I'm not actually sure how informative that is. I looked at it and it wasn't that useful the way that I was looking at it at least. And then the last thing that I'll say, and this is definitely not super relevant, those things might, oops, might not actually even be in an inherent trade-off with each other based on novel insights that we're learning about in deep learning. That might actually just be only a consequence of really small models. That might not even be a real trade-off formulation, which kind of is my point about talking about tensions versus trade-offs. 
Um, but I'm happy to talk about any of those other things right. offline. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's really interesting. I just teed up a lot of things there, uh, Cooper. <laughs> that we I talk too much. No, no, that right a lot of provocations in that. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for a truly excellent opening panel. Um, I have uh, my questions are for Andrew and Katrina. Um, so, Andrew, I was. I was wondering if you could kind of do the work of historicizing a little bit what it is that objectivity and neutrality meant with the 1973 database you're referring to. So obviously the epistemic authority being invoked in that case is quote unquote science or or statistics or you know objectivity of a certain kind. But if you could dwell a little bit more on what that meant in the 1970s against the backdrop of American politics at that point. So, you know, the way in which science as an epistemic authority would be invoked now versus the database you're interested in. And Katrina, um, uh, I, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the way that you uh, kind of framed um, both thinking about criminal uh, recidivism and democracy and voting was sort of speaking in a universalist register. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if you think about it with the, you know, I, I mean, I was curious if you, if your, if your base assumptions are on the US or some other place. Um, and, you know, if, if you do, in, if you do take a particular cultural stance or, or, or political cultural uh, lens towards um, the really interesting question you're posing, how do you think that, uh, say, culture or uh, particular cultural politics um, of, a, of a space or a time shape the way in which uh, the debate you're um, interested in um, actually gets answered or shaped up? Thank you. Uh, th thank you for the question, and I, I can briefly contextualize. If the world we live in today is bounded by this sense of a promise unresolved, things are falling apart. We, you know, we keep having financial crises and wars and Generation Z and millennials, and the baby boomers all feel like, what happened to the dream of the 90s? Where was this brave new world where, where the end of history was supposed to make everything wonderful? In the 1970s, the, the, the general vibe, if you will, the maison scene is revolution unfulfilled. The idea that the civil rights revolution was supposed to herald a succession of justice achievements. We put a man on the moon, of course we can fix society. But what intervened were a series of losses of faith in institutions and authority. What, oh, Watergate and the Nixon scandals, the Vietnam War. Uh, generational conflict, the inability to resolve pressing issues, the fracturing of the coalition that made the rights revolution possible. All of that is in the background. And so when you look at questions like objectivity, you look at questions like authority, there is both a desire to turn to this device, this gleaming mechanical wall of flickering lights that can tell us the truth, but there's also this sense of remove that, wait, these machines are controlled by big government and big banks and big institutions. Can they, in fact, tell us the truth? That's part of that push and pull tension, and we see that a little bit today. I mean, the idea is we, we have to use computers to resolve our problems, but the only way to to get computers to solve the climate crisis is to burn more energy to make the computers work faster. There's this inherent uh, hypocrisy at the core of it. So thank you so much for your question. Um, and thank you for sort of drawing out the, the cultural like embeddedness in my paper. Um, I am writing in the US context and I'm writing, I also recognize that I'm writing at like a specific time. Um, I hope that in the future, the majority of the public feel differently about recidivism, feel differently about sentence, enhance sentence enhancements. Part of the problem with this paper is that um, although I, you know, I broadly at an abstract level say that we accept, re accept prediction in criminal recidivism and would be unlikely to accept prediction in democratic elections, a lot of a lot of people don't know that sentence enhancements are a thing. And if more people knew, maybe we wouldn't use them as much, right? So 
I am writing at a specific time and I hope that that changes. And also, as you mentioned, because you alluded to cultural differences, I'm sure there are plenty of places around the world where a system of predictive voting would be welcomed with open arms, right? So I think at the particular time and place that I'm writing, I think that's unlikely, but it's not to say that it wouldn't happen elsewhere or that it could never happen here. It could, um, but, I, but I am writing at this specific time and in this specific place. So thank you for explicating that. Yeah, uh, thank you really uh, very much for this uh, fantastic panel. Each each presentation was extremely interesting. I, I want to come back to Katrina <laughs> once again. Um, I, I I have a hard time not seeing the preemption in the American voting system. And you speak a little bit. You mentioned your paper uh, gerrymandering, but. Uh, there is also the systematic uh, disenfranchisement, the, the removal of voting right as soon as you have been uh, judged as an offender. Um, that is preemption. It's preemption maybe not on uh, the purely individual level, but it's a preemption in terms of population who, who come to vote, who has a, um, yeah, who is enticed to vote, who is not. To me, it's it's preemption uh, at its uh, at its worst, <laughs> and so um, I, I wonder if we can really oppose these two cases. Even if I agree with uh, really uh, everything you say in your paper, I wonder if we can oppose these two cases as much as you do. And I a, a last point for me is. Um, what is enabled by still not vote, uh, automatizing voting system is the appearance of legitimacy. I mean, the whole democratic institution relies on its legitimacy. And so how do you maintain that while at the same time doing gerrymandering and so on? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So you're, you're absolutely right that there are many ways of distorting voting outcomes that have nothing to do with computational prediction. And those factors already exist, and you alluded to some of them, like gerrymandering. The fact that elections are not held on a public holiday, right? So a lot of people can't take time off work and go and vote. The fact that in certain districts, it's actually very, very difficult to vote. And states, increasingly red states, are making it much harder for people to vote. So. The, the point of this paper is not to imply that voter autonomy is this sort of pure and sacrosanct and protected thing. I agree with you that it's absolutely not. And it, especially in the US, there are a lot of things that already distort voting outcomes. I mentioned voter micro-targeting briefly. Honestly, given, um, given how much polling we already do and given that our environments for absorbing political messaging are so um, siloed and so affected by platforms and you know, recommendation algorithms already, it's very hard as a voter to have access and exposure to countervailing perspectives. So you could almost argue that voters today don't have deliberative autonomy. They might have expressive autonomy, right? They can go to the ballot box and they can cast their vote and no one's going to intimidate them, hopefully, but they don't have a lot of deliberative autonomy if they're making decisions about who to vote for in these like very siloed, very personalized, very narrow digital spaces. Um, and so I think there are people who would agree with you and say that actually the system we have is not that dissimilar from the hypothetical system I described. If you don't have deliberative autonomy, does your expressive autonomy even matter? Like, does it matter if your preferences have been actually constructed for you? I think that's a really difficult question. And I think the fact that we still have expressive autonomy, as you said, goes to the question of like the appearance or the facade of legitimacy. Um, but I think it's a really it's a really deep and difficult question. So thank you for raising it. Before I ask yet another question to Katrina, I just want to tell both Simone and Cooper that I loved your papers. And I have questions about them, but they're great. For Katrina, I'm approaching, and Andrew, I would have, I would have loved your paper, except that I didn't get to read it, but I will <laughs> when you post it. Um, I'm approaching, Katrina, this question, you know, very simple-mindedly, I guess, and it's approaching it as a, splitter rather than a lumper. So trying to figure out, well, what are the contexts in which US um, incarceration decisions use these predictive decisions? 
and near as I can tell, you should absolutely correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we've got basically three contexts. One is the con one is the context where we feel that um, the individuals don't have autonomy or don't have autonomy that should be respected, as in the case of folks who are deemed by virtue of mental disease or defect not to be in control of their own actions. And presumably the whole idea of autonomy is playing a different role there. And the second is in holding people pending trial who've been accused of crimes, but who haven't been convicted. And so there, I'm wondering if there's a policy proposal lurking in or associated with the critique that we should either give all defendants signature bonds or all defendants high cash bonds because that will relieve us of the need to make any predictions as to whether they're likely to show up for trial, because it does seem as if there would be some downsides with either of these approaches. And I guess the third, you know, where the critique is strongest is where a judge sentences within a range. No one might impose a higher sentence because of predictive considerations. And, you know, I don't know because it's not my field to what extent the federal sentencing guidelines allow or incorporate anything like that, but we've got a whole lot of criminal law jurisdictions in this country, and who knows what they all do, although I guess at that point, the issue of prediction is sort of inextricably linked with the question of what we think punishment is for, you know, which is a substantive values question. Do we think it's about retribution, or do we think it's about protecting the community? And, you know, if the latter, it's hard, again, to get away from predictive considerations. But, you know, at that point, we do seem to be looking at a different set of issues than we would be in the context of voting, where there's nothing about, there's no theory of voting that would demand we do it in a predictive manner, whereas there are some theories of punishment that do so demand. Just that. Yeah. Can I add to Katrina to bring Simone into this conversation? Simone, I am curious when prosecutors use these numbers, um, when they use the predictions, if they invoke a theory of punishment, like is that part of the argument? Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge with the pretrial stage is that no one is, you know, um, people haven't been convicted yet. So in some ways, it's not supposed to be punishment yet. Right. Um, and so but we can think of it primarily, I think people think of it primarily as incapacitation still, because it's like you are keeping someone from, you know, not being able to come to court by making them, you know, place them in jail so that they have to come, right? Um, and so in that sense, I think that problem often gets framed in those terms. And when we think about in those terms, this sort of, it seems to set it up well as prediction, like the one of the classic papers, like uh, setting up prediction policy problems, sort of conceives of, of the policy problem as just purely a prediction problem. You just need to know who's going to come to court. You just need to know who needs to be released or not. Um, but I think there's a number of um, you know legal scholars, for instance, who have argued that that's not an appropriate way of thinking uh, about what that decision constitutes. So, um, yeah, she knows. So thank you so much for your question. Um, you're absolutely right that there is a policy proposal lurking in my very too long paper. Um, so I should say openly that I'm a very strict retributivist. So I don't believe in um, incarceration for the purpose of preventing future crime. I, as a retributivist, I believe that um, sentences should just be retributive. Um, that said, I have long sort of had a conf an internal conflict about whether or not risk assessment tools should be used in pretrial detention, because prior to reading Simone's paper, at least, I thought that the empirical evidence was mixed. Um, there was some evidence in some states that risk assessment tools in pretrial detention were diverting low risk defendants from pretrial detention. And that's, I think, a good thing, especially given sort of the very um, the very controversial and racialized effects of cash bail. Having read Simone's paper, I'm not sure, not so sure anymore. Um, I had, for the longest time, I've had a very clear um, position in post-conviction sentencing that I don't think, again, risk assessment tools should be used to predict future crime. I think once you've punished someone, 
um, for a crime they have committed that you've proven that they've committed. I don't think there's a reason to extend that incarceration beyond a retributively divine minimum because you expect them to recidivate in the future. And the reason I say this is because I think there are always options that are less restrictive that will address the community's concerns about safety. You could also make an argument that communities who expect to live in a zero risk environment are not um, you know, thinking about the unequal um, situations created by contemporary capitalism, right? Crime will happen. Is it fair for you to, is it fair for a particular community to expect to live in a society with zero risk if there are less restrictive means of promoting public safety than preemptively incarcerating high risk recidivists? I think yes. Um, so yeah, there is, there is a policy proposal in there and that, that is my theory of punishment and that is how, what has motivated this paper. So so thank you for bringing that up. We're in pre-trial detention. Your critique of predictions, technology, independent of, isn't it? It would apply just as well to judges making seat of the pants uh, predictive determinations without using risk assessment tools. Yeah, so that's true. I think the reason I specifically contrast democratic elections and post-conviction sentencing here is because I'm a little less certain about how I feel about pre-trial detention, although it still is preventive. Um, and I think there is sort of a mixed consensus on that as well. Um, the point of this paper was really just to argue that since we have already normalized the use of predictive technologies in one setting, there's not really much stopping us from normalizing their use in another. Yeah, but thank you. Um, hi, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for speaking. Um, Katrina, you actually answered my question partially while I was, while I was in line here. Um, you were talking earlier about deliberative autonomy versus um, express autonomy and how there's a question about whether or not voters really have it. So I guess the, dis the assumed decisional autonomy of voters also presumes a level of competence on the part of these voters regarding their knowledge of the policies of prospective representatives in local and federal governments. And a variance in the competence of constituents might represent maybe an unaccounted for limit to the de decisional autonomy of the voting base. So how might an algorithm that, well, maybe it generates predictive behavior account for a variance in the competence of the populace to elect politicians that are fit for office? And can the um, current model of democratic voting that assumes a baseline level of competence on the part of voters be considered maybe an overly generous grant of decisional autonomy that could be improved by integrating maybe not a predictive voting system, but an algorithm more broadly in some way. And this is, I guess, a question for anyone that's interested in answering it. Yeah, thank, thank you. I'll take a stab at it. So I think your question sort of um, identifies a very deep philosophical debate that has long standing implications for like how we define autonomy. Um, so if you if you define autonomy as, you know, higher order reflection on your second order reflection on your first order needs and preferences, then I think a lot of people couldn't really be classified as autonomous when they're making decisions. What I should say is people make bad decisions, right? They don't make decisions in their objective interests, however you define those objective interests. So you could say that a lot of voters for example, who vote for a candidate who are going, who vote for a candidate who plans to cut social security. If they are someone who depends on social security, voting for someone who does that is not really in their objective interests, but they're going to make that vote anyway. Like people vote for so many different rational and irrational reasons. I think my, the way I define autonomy in this paper is very generous. I want people to have that choice, even if you could argue from the sidelines that that choice is not in their objective interests. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about what is the threshold for regarding a voter as having deliberative autonomy? Does it mean like a minimal um, amount of exposure to political messaging? Does it mean a minimal amount of education or literacy? The US has never imposed those requirements on people. And so I would say the threshold for regarding a voter as having autonomy cast a vote is actually pretty low. Whether or not we want to raise that threshold is like a very difficult and deep question that I cannot possibly answer today, but I think it's a really interesting one. So yeah, it's it's absolutely important to think about how we define autonomy in the context of democratic elections. Thank yeah, you. I'd like to add on to that and appreciate Katrina's points. 
regarding autonomy, it reminds me uh, a few years ago, I was at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, an organization that Meg knows well, and they had me do a debate with Martin Hibbert about this notion of algorithmic governance. And Martin is an adherent of this idea that if you iterate enough, you can drive out bias and that bias is inherent in what humans do, and that the machine can actually eliminate the bias. And I'm an adherent of the garbage in, garbage out approach, which is that the machine will always generate bias results because everything that you feed it will ultimately be biased. And it gets at this question of autonomy. Do we want an autonomy of inputs that are flawed or an autonomy of outputs that are flawed. And I think that's something that we as a society of technologists and technology users have not quite agreed upon yet. Katrina, Andrew, thank you. I'm chiming in with another question from the chat and it's a broad one. It's from Gabriela Galerza. So I'll say that anyone who would like to take a stab at it can. Uh, they ask, what are your thoughts about chat GPT? <laughs> I was thinking when I was reading Katrina's piece that so many people will ask chat GTP who they should vote for given a set of priorities like I don't really want to go research all these people and I definitely don't want to research like their dirty laundry like if I just if my priorities are climate change child care and whatever like who's the most likely candidate to achieve any of those goals I think a lot of people will ask political questions that have significant impact on both their well at least their um um well, a couple of a couple of levels of autonomy are triggered by that type of garbage in, garbage out <laughs> political discords. Anyone else have thoughts they want to share? Yeah, I guess it's not. Um, I, I teach this class about like technology and society, and one of the assignments that students are doing is they're asking ChatGPT to propose like different methods for selecting people for like say admission college admissions or for hiring or for credit or whatever um and so we're using that to sort of test the bounds of like what are the like how broad is chat gpt's imagination of um the kinds of interventions that we can take or the ways in which we can select people as a way to build intuitions about i think some work about you know arguing that increasing sort of termination of foundation models is going to homogenize like selection processes it's like a major concern that like as you mentioned uh cooper in your talk that it increases this like over reliance on you know picking on the same person over and over again right so um i mean as it relates to this panel this is something that I've been thinking about it a little bit, um, but it's less fun than asking it to, you know, write a poem for you. So, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all for providing this amazing talks. My question is actually related to ChatGPT, more specifically whether we should use it in a justice and law setting, because nowadays ChatGPT has been used in so many fields, and we cannot promise that people won't use it for doing research when preparing for um, court trials. So should we, from a systematic view, ban the use of ChatGPT or other large language models in the system? Or should we use it in a critical way under regulations? What's your thoughts? Great, thank you. Oh, I, I can't offer a prescriptive answer in such an August uh, law-based facility, but I can provide from my own experience. As a cultural historian, I'm less interested in what JetP chat GPT does than how people respond to it and the cultural overlay applied to it. And being based in Washington at the Smithsonian, I was asked to give a tour of the Air and Space Museum to a congressman, a high-ranking member of the Budget Committee uh, last week. And one thing he wanted to ask me as the federal government's computer historian is, what do I think about chat GPT and should they be using it in Congress? And I told him what he needs to do is read up on these technologies of machine learning and try to understand what is it that people want to use them for? Why are we seeking out these tools to use these problems? Uh, I'll leave it to my more learned colleagues for the, the technical side, but I think what's important to understand about Jet GPT is that we as a moment, we as a society are at the moment perceiving it as a magic and I want to understand what is it we're trying to shoot with that bullet before we fully embrace loading our gun with it. 
Um, yeah, that covers actually uh, way more eloquently than what I would have said. Um, some uh, similar things. I'll just add one piece of this uh, to this, which is that uh, in sort of implicit in your question, I'm reading an interest in a new kind of search tool, right, to help you do research. And from that perspective, we actually have no idea how good of a search tool these kinds of technologies are to actually give you the answers that you want to have. I mean, everything I talked about in my talk, there's a notion of ground truth, and I mean that very loosely, but there's a label in the data that people compare to to say, is was my decision accurate? Uh, generative modeling and a lot of machine learning, there is absolutely no even sort of fake stand-in proxy for ground truth, and that would be true for all of generative modeling at this point. We have very poor ways of assessing their quality. So if you want to use it for, you know, as a, a search tool, I would use it with some like limited con you know, confidence because we have no idea, you know, sometimes we know when it's spewing garbage. We often don't know when it's spewing garbage. And there are a lot of people that are working on generative modeling more, more generally uh, as like a next step, you know, evolution in, in a, what was once called information retrieval, sometimes still called information retrieval. But the thing that's wild to me is that we're watching all this play out like in gamma, not even in, oh, sorry, in alpha, not even mm -hmm. in beta, right? Uh, like out in the world. And that just seems like not super responsible from an engineering practice perspective is what I would say. Not a really deep answer, kind of obvious, but what I think nevertheless. Yeah, can I add to that too, that, um, that these models pull from open available sources and legal materials are not that. So one of the, the problems with doing legal research is that when we're trained in places like this, we use freely to us, but very expensive um, databases to in particular to get at high quality legal resources. So at this point, something that could theoretically serve as a democratizing tool for legal research or um, legal writing is pretty limited with from the garbage in problem. Thank you. I'm going to jump in really quickly. I apologize. Um, with another question from the chat from Neha who asked to the whole panel, predictive policing reminded me of the film Minority Report. Is this going to be the future of policing? To what extent is the use of such algorithms slash AI slash ML ethical and effective in promoting justice and ensuring equal treatment for all individuals, particularly those belonging to minorities? Not an expert in this, but my understanding from what I've read in the context of doing some work in algorithmic fairness is this isn't new at all, right? It's just actually a rebranding in some ways of things we've been doing for a much longer time. Uh, so if there's, we're going to continue to develop methods that are going to be used for predictive policing, which at least, you know, the thrust of research on algorithmic fairness and an interest in trying to align that with other goals uh, which, which seem to suggest, then yeah, I think like, you know, we, we're already seeing, you know, drones, uh, at least, you know, they've been pushed back, right, but uh, using drones for surveillance purposes in inner cities um, and things like that. There's nothing here I think is actually Correct me if I'm wrong. Nothing that either one of us presented on today is like particularly shocking or new. It's just like the latest iteration of trying to solve right uh, a problem that, in some ways, actually the technology has created. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been going on to an extent since police in Indiana in the 1960s attempted to gather information on tape reels and see if they could use it to predict where burglaries would happen. Well, I don't think we're at the point of having precogs sitting in waiting pools trying to determine whether crimes will be committed. But what's worth noting is that any push towards predictive criminal justice based on algorithms must have robust stop gaps and checks and backups to ensure human intervention. Because as we know, our justice system is flawed and an algorithm is just as likely to execute an innocent person as is a biased jury. Hi, my question is for Cooper. Um, it seems the argument about statistical variance applies just as well to guessing the past, which is how algorithms are trained, as to predicting the future, which is how they are used in production. So I was wondering if there's a part of the argument about arbitrariness that relates to something inherent in the practice of forecasting. And if not, could a proponents not argue that a good enough answer to those concerns is some form of model averaging? 
There's a lot in your question, which I'm happy to talk about uh, offline um, as well. Uh, but my short answer is that I think description, which is the describing the past, this is what I'm going to map that to, is inherently different than prediction that we're then going to use to respond to a future world. So even if we could use a similar tool, whether we call it classification of, pa of the past, right? Because you could use it, the example I used to say, you know, how good is our model of the past? But the point is that people are, if they're using it to predict recidivism to the future, that's sort of the thing that's more that's more interesting to me as someone who's looking at how people are using algorithm, algorithmic interventions out in the real world. But you are right that like you could be using it for descriptive purposes. And in fact, that seems much safer to me in some respects. There are other risks with that in terms of other biases you could do in your analysis if you're only going to look at quantitative um, sort of analysis. But inherently, it's very different than using it to, you know, actually this aligns with a lot of what Katrina was talking about, sort of using it as sort of an ex ante approach to limit or prescribe um, mm. people's behavior out in the world in the future. Okay, we've got one last question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel in general uh, that two years ago, the White House Office of Science, Tech, and Policy began asking for comments about building an AI Bill of Rights, citing privacy discrimination and explainability concerns. Do you think there would be any need for an AI Bill of Rights to create new rights against algorithmic decision making in the government or by the government? Yes. <laughs> yes. I also agree. Um, I don't know how it should be framed or formulated. I think there's a lot of um, interesting developments happening in the EU um, that we could sort of emulate or try to learn from. So I hope that we start there, but broadly my answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I get a final round of applause for our panelists?